hello uh, and good evening uh, to week two of uh, digital forensic short course. Um, can someone signal me if the sound is all right? All good. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, look, thank you very much for joining in uh, for the second week. Uh, uh, so, uh, given that uh, uh, many of you are here, so looks like there is a uh, there's an interest and people enjoyed uh, uh, the first week uh, uh, session. And uh, I can also uh, see that from more than thousand post posted on the discussion forum, uh, so people were really engaged, committed to to solve those uh, two hands-on projects, uh, and most importantly, people were very collaborative and helpful. So that was. Really Really great to see uh, that uh, if somebody is posting uh, an issue, a problem, and within a minute uh, somebody jumping in to answer that. So that was really great, and uh, that made my life easy. And so uh, instead of like me coming in and replying to every post, so in fact that is one of the objectives of uh, uh, these webinars to get you started and and to basically uh, learn from each other, acquire the knowledge from um, each other as, uh, as many of you have uh, decades of experience in IT um, uh, and a lot of you in security. So that's great um, happening. Um, look, in terms of the responses uh, or your solution, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, disagree with most of you. Uh, but I would like to mention a few names uh, who really contributed well in terms of providing the analysis and, and the reflection of those two projects from last week uh, uh, projects. Uh, I would like to mention Sam, Sam Brazier, Trent Brooks, Craig Mewich, uh, Philip Little, Steve Oxley, Scott Miller, uh, look, I mean, please uh, pardon me if I don't mention, uh, I mean, as I said, there were more than 1,000 posts, so I mean, just, these are the names, they just pop up straight away when I looked at the post. Um, yeah, and, and today there were some more amazing reflection from uh, Rodney Parkin, um, Kimberly Dre, and Mike O'Malley. Uh, great discussion. In fact, that is what uh, uh, I wanted to see, not just uh, uh, the outcomes of the projects, uh, but what you learn and what you felt. So much broader discussion on the forensic process which you have gone through. So that was really great to see uh, from week one um, interaction. Now, um, uh, in terms of the questions asked last week, uh, as you can understand that there were more than 700 people in the webinar, so it was not practical to answer each and every question. However, I have provided written responses to all the questions which were posted last week. Uh, Margie had just uploaded uh, uh, on uh, on the discussion forum, on the introductory discussion forum. So please have a look at those questions and answers. Uh, feel free to drop in uh, if you have further questions relevant to, uh, to, to those uh, questions or answers or relevant to this week's uh, discussion. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, now, tonight plan uh, again, and that's a short notice that uh, uh, that this uh, course, this mini course, is uh, is part of our ITC 597 digital forensic subject, which uses uh, uh, this particular textbook uh, as a recommended reading, uh, and we're just covering, or oh, maybe just one fourth of uh, uh, that 12 weeks uh, uh, subject at CSU. Okay, so tonight we're looking at data acquisition and validation. So last week uh, we looked at uh, basis uh, uh, for digital forensic investigation, the role of a forensic investigator, the expectations, um, and uh, we discovered uh, pro-discovered tool as, uh, uh, as an image uh, analysis. So tonight we'll look at how we can use the same tool as well as a couple of other tools uh, for data acquisition to uh, to take the image from uh, our storage media, whether it's a hard disk, uh, USB, or uh, uh, other solid state media from say smartphone or, or tablets. Although tonight's discuss discussion will mainly focus around uh, uh, static acquisition from magnetic disk media and flash drives uh, in the last week, the fourth week, we'll look at more on a digital evidence from solid state devices such as smartphones and tablets. 
So here's the <coughs> plan for tonight. So by, by the end of um, uh, tonight's uh, webinar, uh, we'll figure out what could be the best possible acquisition method uh, and what are the tools to acquire the data and some validating uh, forensic data tools. Uh, and then we'll look at uh, uh, an exercise on data hiding, that how data could be hidden uh, in hacks uh, in ASCII uh, or even in uh, audio or, or visual or an, an image. So the terminology which we use for this uh, technique is called steganography. Uh, I mean, if you look at history, steg, steganography is not something completely new. Uh, people have been hiding data from centuries uh, and, and however, the mood of that hiding and, and the communication of that uh, hidden data was uh, much different. And then we'll look at uh, capturing an image with Pro Discover Basic and Access Data FTK Imager Lite. I have provided this link so, uh, for you to download FTK Imager. So I mean, FTK, the Forensic Toolkit uh, itself is uh, uh, is not a free version. However, the Imager Lite, if you click on this link, that will take you uh, to the to the free the Lite version as well. Okay, uh, now, the first thing is the storage format. When we acquire data, what are the possible storage formats to store the data? Okay, uh, now we'll look, at, we'll look at three types of storage formats. Uh, first one is the raw format. So there used to be only one practical way of copying data uh, for the purpose of evidence preservation and examination. Uh, and examiners performed bit by bit copy from one disk to another disk, the same size as uh, or, or larger. So if you recall, uh, making a copy from older floppy disk to floppy disk, so copy to copy, or CD to CD, or DVD to DVD. So we call that a raw format, taking the image as is without changing the shape or nature of an image. Yeah, so um, the last of the utilities, uh, you, can, you can go back to, again, if, if people are familiar, still remember the, the disk operating system, uh, the, 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 the command line operating system using the copy command copy uh, from a source drive to a destination drive, or people who are using Linux using the DD command and data dump. So, yeah, so that has made possible to write bitstream data to files. So this copy te technique creates simple sequential flat files of a suspect drive uh, or data set. To, uh, to a target drive. Yes, and we, we call that a raw format. I mean, there are some advantages and disadvantages uh, when you are selecting an acquisition format. Uh, with the raw format, the advantages are fast data transfers and the capability to ignore minor data read errors on the source drive. And, and most forensics tools can read the raw format, making it a universal acquisition format for most tools. However, the disadvantage for the raw format is that it requires as much storage as the original disk. Remember, copy to copy. Yes, so uh, another disadvantage is uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, that you won't find some, some latest tools uh, reading the raw format. You might, have, you might not collect uh, uh, marginal or bad sectors um, I I when you're copying from source to destination using the raw format. Now, there are uh, several commercial uh, acquisition tools available uh, to produce raw formats, such as, uh, and we can, we can verify the raw formats by using uh, CRC32, the cyclic, re cyclic redundancy check. Uh, we can use MD5, the message digest technique, or secure hashing algorithm, SHA1, or later hashing functions uh, to validate uh, that copy was intact. Now, the second type of format uh, of um, acquisition formats are proprietary formats. Um, as you can understand from the terminology proprietary, uh, these are the, for the forensics tools, which have created their own formats for collecting digital evidence. 
So typically, several features uh, that complement the vendor's uh, analysis tool uh, and, and the options to compress or not compress the image files, unlike raw format, uh, where you have to copy the image intact. Yes, so these are, uh, the advantage with the property is uh, uh, we can compress, saving the target uh, drive space. Um, and it also has the capability to split an image into smaller uh, segmented files for arch archiving purpose. Um, assuming if you are taking an image of a larger, say in terabytes, so you want to save that in, chunk in small chunks. So we have that uh, capability with the property formats uh, such as your uh, ProDiscover or FTK imager uh, to, to, to store that uh, um, in a target drive into smaller uh, sizes. However, one major disadvantage for proprietary format acquisitions is uh, the inability to share an image between different vendors uh, computing forensics tool. For example, uh, the iLook iX imaging tool, iX Imager produces three proprietary formats, IDIF, uh, IRBF, and IEIF that can be read only by iLook IX. Uh, similarly, uh, with the ProDiscover, you might not find some other tools to read .e, uh, .ev, uh, the, the format which is created using ProDiscover. Um, and by looking at uh, all the property formats, uh, uh, one tool uh, we call that expert witness format is an unofficial standard. However, if this standard is followed, I mean, it's, it's, it's broadly used with a software end case. This produces both compressed and uncompressed image files, um, and it has got the capability to write, to write an extension starting with uh, .e01 um, as compared to a ProDiscover where we have .e um, extension. Yes, so you can use uh, uh, proprietary uh, tools such as X-Ways Forensics, Access Data Forensics Toolkit, FTK, uh, and Smart for proprietary um, images. Now, the last, the third format, we call that Advanced Forensics Format, AFF. I have provided a couple of links here to learn more about uh, AFF. Uh, just a couple of features. Uh, now, this format is capable of producing compressed or uncompressed image files. Yes, you can save the storage space. Uh, there's no size restriction, so you can create the whole disk image, or if you wish, you can have uh, in a small junks. Uh, and it's, uh, the space in the image file can be segmented from metadata, and, and it's simple design with extensibility and open source for multiple computing platforms. So unlike proprietary uh, platform uh, with advanced forensic format, you can uh, you can uh, run that, you can read that into a variety of uh, tools. Okay, after looking at the three types of formats, you know, uh, the next question is the types of acquisitions. Okay, uh, you know, uh, we have two types of acquisitions, uh, static acquisitions, and uh, live acquisitions. Now, as a terminology self-explain, with a static acquisition, it's done on a computer which is seized during a police raid. For example, if the computer has an encrypted drive, a live acquisition is done if the password or passphrase is available. So when you're not dealing with unencrypted data, that means the computer is powered on and has been logged on uh, or, or by suspects. Say during the police raid, when you identify the computer connected to the network, so the best possible uh, acquisition would be live acquisition. But if you have uh, seized an image, seized a computer or a laptop, taken to your forensic lab, so it's more likely that you'll be performing uh, a static acquisition. So either way, we look at uh, four methods of data collection. Uh, either creating a disk to image file, if, uh, if you, you still recall, uh, with the ProDiscover. So we have that, uh, uh, that capability to take a disk to image or disk to disk as is. Yeah, so we'll look at uh, these first two uh, data collection methods. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so this to image is the most common method that offers the most flexibility uh, for investigation. So we can make one or many copies of suspect drives. So remember, one of the techniques uh, with the forensic examination is uh, uh, take, uh, keeping the original, the master file as is, and doing the examination uh, on the copy, not the actual uh, image. So these copies are bit-for-bit bit replication of the original file, and you can use other forensics tools such as ProDiscover, NCASE, FTK, Smart, or SleuthKit, or X-Ways Forensics, or as I mentioned earlier, iLookIX to read the most common types of uh, disk to image files you create. So this is the reason why this to image is more desirable, uh, because many tools uh, available, they can read uh, this to image. Now, sometimes you can't make this to image because of hardware or software errors or incompatibilities. So this problem is more common when you have to acquire older drives. So say, think of uh, uh, those, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, okay, thinking back 15 years ago, the tape drives um, or, or the floppy drives. Y yes, so, so you might have to create a disk-to-disk -disk copy of the suspect drive. So several imaging tools can copy data exactly from an older disk to a new disk. So these programs can adjust the target disk geometry, such as cylinders, heads, and track configuration, so that the copied data matches the original uh, suspect drive. Uh, and uh, these imaging tools uh, include NCASE and X-Ways forensics. Um, you can have a look at uh, manual for these vendors uh, to see how these tools can capture disk-to-disk -disk, uh, images. Now, uh, how to determine best method? It depends on the circumstances of the investigation. Uh, you might have to look at uh, also uh, the time available. Uh, like if the time is limited, you might have to consider using a logical acquisition or sparse acquisition that are copies. So when I say sparse acquisition, uh, I'm referring to uh, acquisition of folders or, or certain files where you know where the evidence could be possibly. And if you think that the evidence was, say, a, uh, I mean, if you have a tip that the evidence could be in the audio file, or video file, you want to maybe you, you you may want to only capture those folders where these certain files are available. Yes, yeah, so we 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 talk about this slide already. Uh, just look at the last line here with with this to this uh, beside end case and X ways forensics. So we have a uh, safe back and snap copy tools as well uh, to take to create a disk to disk image. Okay, uh, now uh, logical acquisition can take a lot of time. So, I mean, with a, the, the major benefit of a logical acquisition is uh, it captures the files uh, of interest to the case or specific types of file. Uh, sparse is similar, but it collects fragments of unallocated deleted data as well, and, and these methods can be well used when you do not need to examine the entire drive. Uh, an example of a logical acquisition could be you want to examine an email invest, for example, uh, in a case where you were to examine uh, emails, uh, which requires only looking at the outlook.pst or .ost files, so in that case, you'll be better looking at uh, a logical acquisition. Um, another example could be uh, collecting specific records from a large RAID, RAID RAID servers. So if you have to recover data from a RAID or larger storage area such as SAN, storage area network server with several, say, exabytes or zettabytes uh, or more of data storage, the logical method might be the only way you can acquire the evidence. Yes, so as I said earlier, that uh, what method to use, it all depends on the size of source, uh, whether you can retain the source disk as evidence or must return to the owner or how much time you have to perform the acquisition and where the evidence is located. So if you're 
having a larger source drive such as say, four terabytes or more you have to make sure you have a, a target disk that can store a disk to image file of that large disk yeah so consider uh, the compression methods such as pk zip or winzip or winrar uh, to analyze uh, or to have to, to compress data into a lossless compression okay uh, now as I mentioned earlier, that is always advisable to create uh, uh, several uh, duplicates. So when you're creating a duplicate of uh, your evidence, um, at least make uh, two image files. Uh, and we want to make sure uh, that uh, the evidence you are collecting remain intact and you maintain the chain of custody. Uh, and very important is uh, looking at uh, the host protected area of a disk as well and, and see what copying method can uh, can copy the HPA. You know, HPA is normally not accessible through a uh, normal operating system. So some of the acquisition tools might not copy the host protected area of a disk drive. So have a look at the vendor's documentation to verify that the tools which you are using is able to copy HPA. So uh, one way is to uh, to look at whether the tool can access the BIOS, BIOS uh, um, uh, data. Uh, I mean, tools such as ProDiscover with the right blocker or Image Master, Solo or X-Ways or Replica. These are the tools which can read a disk HPA. So. Um, and 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 um, um, if you look at the Microsoft uh, recent versions, um, they they come with a uh, with a whole disk encryption with a bit locker uh, to its newer operating system such as Windows 7 or or, or, or or onwards, so which makes performing static acquisition more difficult. Uh, so, and and you can find several other third-party whole disk encryption tools uh, which you should be familiar with as much as you can uh, as part of the contingency planning so you must be prepared to deal with the encrypted drives and a static acquisition on most whole disk encrypted drives currently involves decrypting the drives before you can actually read those drives so this requires a users cooperation uh, or access to their decryption key before you can actually uh, um, read those images okay uh, now there are certain acquisition tools uh, which are only uh, Windows based and the advantages to use uh, Windows uh, acquisition tools is uh, more of uh, looking at the convenience um, especially when using hot swappable devices uh, where you are able to uh, capture USB 3 or FireWire um, 1394A or FireWire 1394B or SATA to connect this to your workstations. So in, in this case, Windows acquisition tools uh, will have some drawbacks, um, such as uh, if there's a protected, uh, if the protected data uh, well tested right blocking hardware device uh, would block that captures so tools can't acquire data from a disk host protected area and and some countries have not accepted the use of right blocking devices uh, for data acquisitions again you want to look at the context of the case uh, and and uh, seek advice from your attorney uh, when you are uh, doing the data acquisition which requires uh, encrypted drive okay uh, now, before we go on to our hands-on, um, I would like to mention uh, Microsoft Mini Win FE, uh, the forensic uh, uh, acquisition uh, capability in Windows. So, now this is a Windows Boot Utility, which enables you to build a Windows forensic boot CD or DVD or a USB drive uh, with a modification is Windows registry so that uh, uh, the files that connected uh, uh, drives are mounted as read only you are able to to read those files as well so uh, and once you have mini win FE uh, so go to this link uh, and you will see access to uh, mini uh, win FE uh, and to and if, and if you plan to further investigate this area, uh, create a boot CD or boot USB, uh, 
and review the documentation and download the software from, from this web link, which is provided on top of this. So in addition, you also need a Windows installation DVD, and if you're using version 8 or later, and FTK Imager Lite or X-Ways, uh, when you want to work on a mini WinFE uh, ISO file um, before you actually create the, uh, the, the bootable CD. So have a look at some free tools uh, called ISO to USB, uh, which is available on ISO2USB.com. Uh, just simply typing in www.ISO2USB.com. Okay. Uh, no, data acquisition with the Linux boot CD. Uh, I mean, Linux operating system has many features that are applicable to digital forensics, uh, in particular with data acquisition. So one unique feature is that Linux can access a drive that is not mounted, um, and, and physical access for the purpose of reading data can be done uh, on a connected media device, such as a disk drive or USB or other storage device. Um, and, and when you're creating a, a, a Unix uh, live CD, uh, you will have to look at uh, uh, several Linux distributions such as uh, uh, Ubuntu or OpenSUSE, Arc Linux or Fedora or Slackware, which provides the ISO images that can be burned to a CD or DVD, uh, we call Linux Live CD. And, and most of these distributions are for uh, Linux operating system recovery, not uh, not primarily for digital forensics acquisition analysis. However, um, some of these uh, images are designed specifically for digital forensics, which contain the utilities uh, which are typically installed. I mean, which are not uh, which are typically not installed on the Linux distributions. Yes. Yeah, so some of these uh, utilities uh, are provided uh, on this slide. So, I mean, whether you are configuring uh, or mounting or not, a hard disk drive, only read-only, yes, so, you, I mean, these are the, I mean, this is the list of well-designed Linux live CDs for, for computer forensics. So, uh, depending on uh, what your taste is, yeah, so you can, you can explore uh, maybe a couple of these uh, or getting to know as many of these uh, uh, as possible um, is a way to, uh, to, to learn more um, if you are, I mean, if you like to work on Linux. Okay, uh, now we mentioned earlier that, uh, uh, that, that when you acquire data, I mean, some tools, they have built-in capability to validate, to validate uh, the source image with the target image, uh, and, and um, some of these hashing functions, whether uh, CRC32, MD5, or SHA1, or 512 are used um, to to validate whether uh, the image was the true copy of the source. Um, yeah, I'll show you um, soon uh, that you can use uh, some of the hex tools, such as WinHex, um, to uh, to take the uh, uh, to the hash value of the of the source and compare with the with the destination. Okay, uh, now the last point here in terms of discussion I want to mention is uh, about uh, network acquisition tools. I mean, uh, these are very intelligent tools which can help uh, capture uh, the, um, the, the images uh, remotely. Uh, not always, uh, I mean, the, the drawback is that the the software, the remote capturing software, need to be installed uh, on, on the suspect computers. So this is only possible uh, if you are uh, doing a corporate uh, high-tech investigation uh, where the software is already installed and employees are aware of that, and when you are handling uh, a breach of a corporate policy case, so you can use these tools to, to take a, a remote image uh, uh, and examine that. Now, a pro-discover incident response is designed to be integrated as a network intru intrusion analysis, uh, and uh, and if you if you happen to have access to uh, the full version of ProDiscover, you will see the PD server capability, uh, which is the ProDiscover utility uh, for remote uh, data acquisition, uh, that must be loaded on the suspect computer uh, before ProDiscover incident response can access that. 
yeah so uh, i mean there are uh, other um, uh, tools such as trusted CD uh, for manual installation uh, which can create a special CD or DVD or USB drive containing the ProDiscover server remote agent which can be loaded manually on the suspect computer or pre-installation for networks which are configured with a, uh, a PD server remote agent can be added to the standard installation of high-risk computers. Um, which enable the network security administrators to respond to network attacks um, uh, and uh, yeah yeah so um, uh, feel free to explore uh, again but you need to have access to the full version of ProDiscover basic uh, uh, to have access to the uh, PD server remote agent <laughs> no uh, with the remote acquisition uh, the drawback is that if suspect is aware or, and if they want, they can disable the remote access and uh, some antiviruses, antispirers or firewalls tools, they can block the access to the uh, system uh, and the suspect can easily install their own security tools uh, which can create an alarm uh, when, the, when they're remotely being accessed. Okay, you know, that's a discussion part. Uh, now, let's go on to uh, some hands-on stuff. So, in the meantime, uh, let me have a look at uh, uh, question window if there are some, uh, if there are a couple of uh, uh, critical questions which we can uh, address. So, okay, let me... Hi, Time Beard, would you prefer I read them out to you? Uh, yes, please, I really appreciate that, Margie, that'd be great. No worries. Um, so going backwards, uh, hi Tanvi, is it possible to recover data from disks if the data was written over it? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, if the overwritten data, I mean, if, if still the, the fat, I mean, again, looking back, the, the, the geometry of the disk, um, and if the file allocation table have not been overwritten, it is possible uh, to still recover the data. However, if the sectors in the fat, they have been overwritten, um, it may not be possible to retrieve the data. Uh, yep. Um, someone else has asked, um, or said, I would have thought that MD5 was discredited for chain of evidence usage. No, I mean, look, MD5 is a, is a hashing function and a very popular hashing function uh, which can be used to verify. So um, I'm not aware uh, that uh, in, in what, what jurisdiction it was discredited. I mean, if you are aware, uh, please post that on the forum, a link to the source so that we can, we can explore more. Um, if I have used if I used a live Linux USB pen drive, uh -huh. does that also have the right blocking caveat as a live CD? Um, look, I mean, um, the right blocker are the external tools. Uh, um, like after you take the image, you have to basically attack the right blocker uh, with that uh, uh, source uh, disk or drive to ensure that you don't ac accidentally write it, overwrite it. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, Unix is not which I use uh, uh, frequently, so uh, maybe you want to explore that further by, by working it out. Um, two more questions. Uh, how does remote acquisition stand up as evidence considering the data may have changed in transit? Um, uh, okay, that will depend on the on the tool which you use and how you can demonstrate that from, from the collection of data until the data was examined, uh, there was no change. So perhaps uh, as soon as the image is taken, uh, taking the hash value of that image, uh, and when you're creating the copy, taking the hash value to, value to ensure that the original image and the copy hash value match to validate uh, the original data. Uh, and if there was a mismatch, yes, there was a likely that data after taking the image was compromised. Uh, but if you can prove, you can demonstrate that from the original image to the copied image which was examined, there was no change in data. So uh, I mean, that should not create any, any, any issue in, in demonstrating the, the validity of data. Um, and last one, uh, what are some top remote uh, Sorry, what are some top remote acquisition tools? Uh, I mentioned with the ProDiscover, the PD server remote agent. Um, and um, uh, 
and, and I mean, NCASE itself has its own tools, but they are not free. I mean, even the PD server is not free. Uh, some other, uh, with NCASE, uh, um, you can have a look at, uh, I mean, the other tools are R tools, which is from um, R Studio, uh, and uh, another tool is US LAT, L A T T Pro. Uh, is part is developed by uh, Redstone um, and F Response is another tool. So there are quite a few tools uh, you can explore. No worries. Thank you, Margie. So let's move on to the hands-on stuff. Okay. Now, uh, okay, I'll bring uh, here the. Okay. Yeah. So this week uh, study guide. So I believe people can see uh, the study guide in front of you. The week two data acquisition and validation. So no, what I want you to take you through uh, some hands-on uh, which can help you in solving these projects. Okay, uh, now I wanted to do an exercise on capturing an image uh, uh, from Pro Discover, what I'll do is I'll okay before we come back on this, uh, I'll simply point where and how you can use the Pro Discover to capture the image. Okay, uh, no, I have the Pro Discover open, so I will not do that because capturing an image take lots of time. So if you go in action. And you see that uh, the first, the, the topmost option here is capture image. Uh, and here you will you will choose the source drive. And in this case, I have, I mean, the physical, my hard disk. But at the same time, I have, uh, say, 3.75, so 4 gigs of uh, um, thumb drive here. So, yes, yeah, so choose the source drive. And then click on these double arrows here. Uh, choose a local path where you want the image to be stored. Um, okay, so, and then, okay, say if I choose this one, save over here, uh, and then the slip option provides you, okay, I must choose the, the target drive, uh, okay, uh, let me go to my work folder for week two, okay, short course. Yeah, so give a name, say, um, okay, week two, acquisition, uh, save as. And then when you click on split, so that is where uh, you can split that. See, I mean, see, the source image is four gigs. If you want two chunks of, say, uh, two gigs, so you might want to write here 2,000 mags, uh, or if you want four chunks, so you can do that. Uh, and that's it. Uh, once you click on OK, it will start capturing the image, and it will take a few minutes. Yes, yeah, so so that's one way to take to, to capture uh, the image using Pro Discover. Uh, now another new tool which I want to introduce tonight is uh, uh, FTK uh, Light Imager. So now let me bring here in front of you. Um, I have here. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a shortcut to my uh, FTK Imager. Hopefully that will come back. Okay, yeah, here it is. So you see, uh, I mean, the the look is quite similar. There's a there's a tree view, uh, and then uh, we have the the work window, work area, and data area on the lower right hand side. So uh, now since uh, we're first time doing the FTK, so okay, uh, and, and and I pointed out in the in the PowerPoint slide where you can download the FTK. If you go back to the very uh, few, yes, access data. So this, this is the link where you can download the FTK. Okay, uh, now let's go back to our FTK. Yeah, so, okay, let's, okay, let's give a quick go to take, uh, to create an image using FTK. Uh, okay, uh, we start with the, okay, uh, and uh, okay, just give me a second. Okay, yes. So we'll start with the with the create image disk. So file, 
and um, create image disk. And then we're looking at uh, choosing the first option, the source, uh, physical drive. This we want to capture the, the, the thumb drive as is. Click on uh, next. Yes, yeah, so see it will it will show me what are the uh, storage devices I have connected. So I'll click on uh, my USB drive, four gigs in here, and then I'll click on uh, finish. Okay, and uh, create the image. And and you want to have this option verify images after they are created. So that will verify using the hashing function. So select the destination image type. So we stick with the raw uh, format. Um, if you want E01, E01 is the end case format. And discuss earlier AFF is the advanced forensic format. And the smart is smart data format. So we stick with the raw format. Uh, click on next. And then you can you know, give a case number. We say uh, week two, uh, average number, say, uh, uh, say week two, uh, exercise, um, unique description if you want to give. So this is a, a, a sample for, yeah, so FTK image acquisition. Yeah, so, yeah, so you can write the notes. Uh, I mean, these are all the administrative uh, notes. Click on next. So image destination folder. So from USB, where I want to store. So again, uh, you'll have to go back to your um, uh, work area, or if you have uh, another uh, USB uh, drive uh, and, and you want to take copy USB to USB, so you can use that. Yes, yeah, so in this case, I'll go into my uh, work area for uh, short course uh, okay yeah an image file name or extension if I want to provide so we can do that so yeah so say uh, uh, say okay I'm just doing acquired uh, data okay and now here image format size so, uh, again I mean if you want to just like in a pro discover you can again create uh, a smaller junk so 1500 or uh, I mean, this is in megabytes, so this is a one gigs, um, and uh, that's it. So as soon as I hit start, so it will start taking that image, uh, and it will take a few minutes. And that's why I will not click on the start button. Yes, yeah, so so that's the second tool you learned tonight: Pro Discover FTK uh, Image Light to to acquire the data. No, uh, let's close this. And let's get back to our uh, exercises, the hands-on projects uh, for this week. Okay, so this is where we were. Now, uh, the hands-on project three and four. Okay, let's click on hands-on project three. Um, okay, it is already available. Thank you, Margie, making it available uh, this evening. So now, what this requires is you have been provided uh, um, uh, an image file, so that's project 3 BMP. Uh, now, the reason why I wanted you to have a practice, have a go on this project, uh, let me mention one more thing. Um, I, I, I had a look at the discussion forum. Um, somebody has actually solved this uh, project already. So well done. Uh, um, my apology, I don't remember the name. So that was great, uh, sol um, solving this project and uh, and uploading the, uh, the the output, the, the plain uh, text which was hidden in this uh, uh, image file. Yes, so, so you wouldn't know where a suspect has hidden uh, a secret data or confidential data. Oh, or data for of interest. So graphic files, I mean, apparently they might seem uh, innocent. However, information can be hidden inside an image file or even inside an audio or video file by using data hiding techniques. Uh, as briefly mentioned, uh, the terminology used for this process is called steganography. Uh, and uh, analyzing a steg image is called steg analysis, so which uses a host file to cover the contents of a secret message. So the, the tool which we're using, I also saw in the, in the discussion forum somebody was complaining, uh, I'm not complaining, well commenting that this is a very user unfriendly tool. Yes, I fully agree with that. I mean, this, this tool was developed in late 90s, uh, but still used. Uh, but I mean, remember any sort of uh, uh, 
machine level or assembly level uh, activities are unuser friendly it's not a GUI uh, or very little GUI and more command base so yeah so when you're dealing with the forensics uh, digital forensics you will have to build up the skills to deal with a the command line and uh, uh, and um, unfriendly uh, unf unfriendly uh, user interfaces yes so the tool which we're using is s tools which can be downloaded from this link and uh, and then what we have to do is you have to basically um, reveal the text from this image now what i'll do is i'll uh, show you uh, a quick exercise uh, using a different image uh, to that how we can uh, hide text and image okay just bear with me uh, let me open my s2 so you have the shortcut here uh, run and see it's very um, as you can see that the person who ever commented was very right that is very uh, very, I would say, um, yeah, so very shallow in terms of any usability or any buttons or images, you know, any, any interactivity or intuitivity. Okay, so now what I'll do is now, uh, I'll, okay, I'll create, uh, okay, this is my, this is my uh, notepad. So I'll create, okay, here a new file. Okay, I call that, okay, uh, okay, I'm just writing one line of text, so this is, uh, uh, this is assumed to be my secret data, which I want to hide on an image file, so this is my, I'll say, secret uh, uh, data, okay, so just this one line, so I'll save this one as, uh, say, secret, sorry, secret text and I'm saving in my week two work folder okay I'll close the notepad now I'll open my week two work folder uh, and see if I have uh, an image file which I can use for this uh, exercise yes yeah, so what I'll do here is okay uh, now you have to work on uh, nicely so that I can have two windows here okay so I have this image file uh, if you guys can see it's called happy dot BMP so that's BMP uh, file format so I bring that simply click and drag that image into uh, yeah into as tools okay see that so currently uh, yes oh, that's tricky so let me bring back again here it is okay now what I want to do is I want to uh, I mean you see that there are not many options uh, here and uh, yeah so so what I want to do is so if you right click on that so you can see the properties of fall uh, how large is that um, and uh, and you can see that reveal when you click on reveal so it looks like there was already some secret image here, but we can overwrite that. So remember the, the note had text file secret which we have created here. So I'll click and drag that file onto this image and see that what it's asking me is a passphrase that how I want to store this image. So I'll type uh, passphrase, okay, uh, I'll say simply say S secret data. I mean, it's not a passphrase you want to type in, but just for this exercise, I'll retype that. And then we can choose the encryption algorithm. I mean, there are three or four options available over here. So pick one of these. So let me go for so DES and then save that. So hide options, okay, uh, leave it uh, as default. And then you saw in, in the quick view there was something happened something happened here showing that the, the, the data had been stored. So what I'll do is now I'll I'll basically save this now and I'll call this uh, okay uh, I'll call this uh, happy hidden dot bmp bmp and I'll save to my 
uh, work folder okay oh let's let me uh, leave it on uh, the desktop for this exercise yeah so I'll I'll close that and uh, in fact I can I can bring that from desktop to my work folder so okay let's have a observation let's have a look at these two uh, files in terms of the size. As you can see that apparently the happy.bmp and happy hidden which has got my secret data, the file size is exactly the same. So apparently uh, there's nothing which can tell us that the original and the hidden um, image have, I mean there's a difference you know, in the file. So now how do we uh, reveal that hidden uh, text from uh, this happy hidden BMP? Uh, let's go back and again uh, we execute our S tools and then we drag that uh, uh, happy hidden BMP in S tool and then uh, right click on the image, click on reveal. Yes, uh, if you remember, I think the the passphrase was secret data. Okay, secret data, and the encryption algorithm which we use was DES. So again, uh, when I click OK, so just have a look at this part of the uh, of the screen. You'll see that something happening. Yes, so it showed us in a, in a, in a second uh, that's revealing. And see here it is, here's my notepad file secret text. What I can do is I can simply save as on my desktop uh, and when I go back to desktop, so I can see that secret text is there. Uh, and um, yeah, so with the line of text which we have there. Yeah, so that's the first exercise you're doing for this week. It's very easy, there are not many options, so uh, the passphrase uh, has been provided, so it shouldn't take more than a few minutes for many of you. So here it is. So yeah, if you ask for a passphrase, uh, this is a bit lengthy, but you can copy and paste the passphrase, uh, and then uh, you have to figure out maybe by hit and trial that out of the four hashing algorithm, uh, which algorithm was used to, to hide that text. So anyway, so this is one simple way of hiding the text uh, or dealing with the hidden text if it is uh, stored on uh, an Im image file. Okay, now let's go back to uh, our second project, project four for this week. Okay, uh, here it is. Now, for this project, uh, slightly different and I, I hope this you will find this one more challenging. So you will have to work in Hex Workshop. It's again, it's a freeware um, tool. Uh, it's a Hex editor. You know, we have provided you uh, a file, project4.txt. Now this file contains um, some scramble bits. No, the terminology, the forensic terminology which we use for scramble bits is called bit shifting. Um, so, so data can be hidden by using low level encryption programs or hex editors uh, and change simply the binary data, the order of the bits and, and the file will look completely different. And then you can use the same program to rearrange the bits. Uh, it's very annoying uh, if you are uh, trying to reveal uh, using these techniques because there's so many combinations, just like uh, opening a lock with the, uh, with the several combinations. Uh, I mean, the, the more number of combinations we have compared with, say, two digits combination to three and four or five, the longer the combination goes on, uh, the harder and more time consuming uh, the, the process would be to reveal that. Yes, uh, it's a very popular technique for hiding data, uh, where data uh, from readable code converted into binary, which can be simply looks as a scrambled data. So the file which has been provided to you, project four text, let me show you how it looks like. Uh, project 4. So if you open that file, this is how it looks like. See, it's all, uh, yeah, seems like, you know, just uh, um, unreadable uh, uh, 
bits, no? So yeah, so let me show you that how you can work on this one. So what I'll do is for this exercise, uh, I'll open um, Hex Workshop. So let me go to, or oh, before that, uh, let us create first uh, a file a simple text file in uh, Notepad. So let's call, okay. Let's uh, type in some text here. So okay, I would say this is my plain text. Okay. So uh, uh, okay, I'll use hex editor to scramble uh, to scramble the bits in plain text. Okay, so let's call this uh, file uh, okay, uh, plain text. Okay, simply leave it as a plain text. Okay, uh, so let's store that in week two, plain text. Close this and now let's open our uh, hex workshop. Okay, so here's my hex workshop. Again, the link has been provided to, to download that. So yes, yeah, so this is the interface for hex workshop. So what I'll do is uh, I'll open the file, the plain text which we have just created in uh, Notepad. So cl double click on that. And you see that uh, on this side of the screen here, you see the, the hex value for the text. And you see in this part of the window, uh, you see that this is the plain text uh, which we have typed in. So at the moment, there's no chain. Uh, now, here are the, the operands which we can use to basically uh, shift the bits. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the byte flip. So if we click on the byte flip, what happens to our plain text? I mean, keep an eye on the plain text and let's watch. So byte flip, okay, you will see there are a number of operands, so you can use these operations to, I mean, create it with a 16-bit unsigned short or 32-bit or 64-bit. So let's leave it 16-bit default value and apply it to entire text file. Click OK. There you go. I mean, you can see that, uh, I mean, it had been scrambled. The plain text had been scrambled. Uh, I mean, if you look closely, you can still work out since this was just one move. One rotation, one rotation. See that T H I S. This is this I is for is uh, a plain. See P L A I in plain text. So this is you know. Yeah. So I'll use uh, a di an editor. Yeah. So we can still make sense and see that uh, how it was you know uh, reversed. So if we save this one, so this would be saved as this rumble data, scramble data, and you can have a combination of. Uh, operations. So I mean the first operation we use was byte flip. Now we can have another one say shift left. So after byte flip, shift left to make it more complicated. And, and you can see that the more options available here uh, and then the ordering options is available as well, avail uh, as well. So leave it default and click OK. And you can see that no uh, I mean the data does not make any sense at all. You can't see any alphabets there anymore. Yeah, so if I save this one, this will be saved as the scramble bits. So that's what I actually did. The scramble file which I have provided you, I have used um, a couple of combinations of these operations to flip the bits and rotate the bits and give you that. So basically you will have to open that file and try one or two or more uh, combination of these operations to reveal the plain text from that uh, uh, scramble text. Yeah, so you know, um, if, I, if I save this one, the plain text will be saved as scramble bits, but I will not do that. Uh, and uh, we'll close this one. Yeah, yes, yeah, so these are two projects. So hopefully uh, you will enjoy uh, this week uh, working on this one. No, uh, I mean, it's okay that if you want to post the outcomes which you have uh, found as a result of two, 
but again, as the outcome would be exactly the same for everyone, um, will be more interested uh, if you provide your experience in one or two sentences uh, that how you figured out. Many people think that this is time consuming. Yes, the forensic process is time uh, consuming. Uh, lots of uh, brute force involved. You might not find a systematic process how to approach, what operand to try first, what not. Uh, look, it's just like uh, you have a lock and you have a hundred keys or you have a thousand keys and only one key works so you will have to try all those keys uh, yes yeah, sometimes it becomes that annoying um, uh, working uh, working working in this area and, and, and become very time-consuming yes yeah, so what will be interested is you know just a couple of line of your reflection um, how you have basically figured out. Uh, I mean, sometimes when I run these sort of exercises, some people use much, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, maybe they have the time, they have the skills, they create macros in Excel, they create scripts to um, uh, to brute force that. But look, I mean, use your imaginations. Um, either way, whether you're successful or not, just line or two, writing what you learn and um, uh, just your analysis and uh, of the use of the tool and if you happen to find uh, a different than these two tools feel free <clears throat> to use those tools as well okay I think that uh, covers what I wanted to <coughs> sorry cover tonight just bear with me please <clears throat> yes yeah, so <clears throat> we looked at uh, that acquisition <clears throat> the format the validation using hashing function. Uh, I, I demonstrated using ProDiscover to <clears throat> to take an image. We used FTK Imager Lite as well. Uh, the last tool which we used was WinX, sorry, WinHex, and S tools for steganography. Now, when <clears throat> next meeting would be more exciting uh, in terms of uh, working on virtual machines, networks, and email uh, forensics. Um, I plan to give you some exercises, a couple of exercises to work in OS forensics. If people have time, they can um, they can explore uh, before the next uh, week webinars. And we'll also look at uh, a Facebook forensic toolkit. Uh, be, be mindful, people who are not in. Uh, in, in Eastern Australia uh, about the daylight saving which will be um, starting from uh, the, the coming weekend so people who are overseas uh, uh, I think Morgi has provided uh, uh, the link to um, day and night uh, date and time uh, um, um, calculated to calculate your uh, time zones uh, uh, I'm sure I saw that uh, with every I think webinar um, schedule so yeah so just click on um, on the webinar schedule and you will see uh, I think that tool uh, is somewhere uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Week two will have it. Week two will have it excellent uh, thank you uh, Margie. Uh, actually it's here uh, when you click on this Yes, so when you click on this, so you can work out your, your local time uh, by looking at time and date uh, too. Excellent. Thank you, Margie. Uh, yeah, so particularly people who are in overseas, uh, yeah, so it will be one hour uh, 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 behind, I think. Yeah, so look, that's all from tonight. So let's look at if there are some quick questions. Otherwise, we'll collect these questions, and as we've done uh, for the first week, uh, I'll respond to those questions uh, in writing and and we'll post that in the forum okay so margie uh, you want to spot any question which can be quickly answered uh yeah uh, so there are a couple here um hi tanvir if we are presented with a thousand or more images to examine for any hidden messages um are there any alternatives besides s tools as you show as you showed us one by one picture examination might be time consuming um okay. I mean, if you remember the the, the second exercise we did uh, in, in the week one, uh, look, I mean, I'm not aware of any uh, any tool which can. Uh, I, mean, look, I mean, if you are writing script, that will be completely different. And uh, if you have the skills to do binary binary level of programming, uh, writing the scripts uh, to look at the binary data, uh, that could be a different story. But in terms of uh, user friendly or GUI tools, I'm not aware of any uh, any tools. Yes, I mean, if you are handed a hard drive, a storage drive of terabytes, uh, and 
there are thousands of images available. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of uh, uh, any tool which can basically expedite uh, uh, the examina examination process. It could be, it, it could become very tricky, uh, and that's why uh, it's more likely that you will work in teams where you will have a group of people examining uh, in this sort of scenario, larger with a larger storage in, uh, involved. Uh, given that your um, example was small in size, what happens if you hide a larger text file within the image file? Does it change the overall size? Um, look, I tried uh, with a few paragraphs and I couldn't see any any difference. Uh, but I mean, if you happen to store, say, uh, several pages, uh, let's try that. Like, I, I haven't tried that, so let's see how it goes. I mean, this could be you know, a task which you can perform. Um, pick up a text of, say, uh, several pages and, and try to hide that and see uh, if the if there's any visible difference in the in, in the two files. Um, so two people mentioned um, when you were uh, doing the um, image um, conversion, uh, mm -hmm. is this essentially a bitwise equivalent of a Caesar cipher? Um, isn't that an encryption system discouraged in modern day? Caesar cipher, okay, uh, I have to get back to this question by uh, looking at uh, more details. I can't answer that at the moment, my, my apologies. But Morgi, if you please put that one uh, uh, in the in the written question, then I'll get back to that, uh, that question. No worries. Um, and how would you go about invest, um, investigating PDFs or other common file formats for this type of encoding? So I'm assuming uh, it was referring to um, uh, to the hidden bytes, or I believe so. Yes. Like it's normally it's a text file we we work in. So uh, if people uh, will send uh, look, okay, um, it's a it's a it's a raw text format where we can basically flip the bytes. Uh, I don't think so. Never tried uh, or never thought of uh, uh, using any other file format uh, uh, to embed the plain data and, and try to. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, we can have a. You guys can have a quick try and see, have a PDF file and see if we can, uh, if you can basically flip some of the bytes and, and, and see if the data can be, you know, uh, scrambled. Uh, look, uh, um, hopefully uh, people uh, got something out of uh, tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, have a go on these exercises. As I said, that um, the first one is is very simple, very basic. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy more with the with the win hacks. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see how people go. And um, I look forward to um, meeting with you in this webinar next week. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good night, good morning, wherever you are, and uh, we'll see you uh, on next Tuesday.